This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, hello, Jumbo Jumbo, and a very good afternoon from the Maasai Mara Triangle in Kenya, and welcome to our drive what we call our sunset drive and as you show my name remains the same my name is David good afternoon everyone and on camera with me is Archie Archie good afternoon and Archie is just there saying stop talking to me and concentrate on the elephants now a very warm welcome again and we're very excited to have you on board today this is how we start our drives in the Mara with such a glorious view and having elephants on the horizon and such a nice clear blue sky on this afternoon, which I guess is a Sunday, with some very good temperatures, I would say it's not hot, but for me, this is pretty warm because we are talking of 80 degrees Fahrenheit and those who like doing metric, 27 degrees Celsius. Now, remember, our drive is very interactive, so we like hearing or we love hearing from you. So, should you have any questions, any comments, as you show, throw them in, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, I have left the camp a little bit early today because I have a plan. I want to look for the sausages. Sausages is a particular pair of lions that I love. I was here yesterday and I was able to see three of those girls and I was also lucky to see three of the, pr of the little calves they got. I didn't see them very well. It was getting very dark and because we have been having some rains in this area, I had to leave them early and head back to camp. So I have come early today so that I can see them in wonderful light and most likely all of you will have great views of these three small little cubs. And of course, a lot of other good things I'll be seeing. Well, this afternoon, it's not only me who is out here doing the safari. There's a gentleman who would like also to say hello, but he's all the way in South Africa. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to Juma Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands in South Africa. David is out with me and we are trying to capture a couple of butterflies from the vehicle. Oh hello, there we go. Looks like I don't know what that is, but it's in a buffalo thorn. There's about 50 butterflies that have been flapping around and doing their thing. Good afternoon, my name is Steve and I'm joined by Darby Sito on camera. And what can I say, who doesn't like butterflies? Let's see if we can capture them again, but this very important time of year, all the flowers are coming through and well, the flowers are providing lots of nectar and pollen for all sorts of insects and as you can see butterflies and many of these trees would actually have been a larval food. Um, there is a black and white pie butterfly, which is normally associated with the buffalo thorn, not necessarily for the pollination, but as a larval food, they will lay their eggs on here. I'm not sure if anybody knows what these greenish butterflies, white green ones are. I can't really get a proper look at them. Uh, and I'm not an expert at looking at them from the outside. So there we are with their proboscis going down, enjoying the sweet nectar of the buffalo thorn flowers, which are very, very sticky and obviously very sweet. A beautiful tree from, it even blends in with it, the leaves, doesn't it? David actually zoomed in on one and thought, ah, oh, that's a leaf. And well, it turned out to be a butterfly. But these trees are very important larval food for many insects. And well, most trees are out here. And I'm going to be carrying on with a little bit of my ecology talk from this morning. And I'll be catching up with a few people to make sure you understood. Or if you missed out, we'll see if we can keep it going. Mrs. Lapwing, who doesn't like a butterfly? And these are very nondescript little greenish ones. I'm sure someone out there who knows their butterflies really well would only take a glance to see that exactly what it is. But when I talk about larval food, it means that when a butterfly or a moth lays their eggs on a tree and the next season with the rains, those eggs hatch and the caterpillars grow through many stages until they eventually become a butterfly. And specific, generally there are very specific trees uh, that certain uh, butterflies will use to lay their eggs on. We spoke about one or two this morning. And I hear the buffalo thorn, a plethora of insects and beetles generally moving through. But obviously, we are also going to be heading through to see if we can find a dead Steenbok. 
being looked after by Horsana. And, but on the way, I'm going to make sure to finish off my ecology talk from this morning. But in the meantime, let's go over to Sydney for Mulana Kosi. And look at the beautiful skies. You can see that the rain is promising to come and fill all of the dams here by the western side of the Greater Kruger National Park Juma Game Reserve. And this is Sydney, Fumuran Mikosi, and most of all, welcome to the beginning of our afternoon safari. My plan this afternoon is quite very easy. I will be looking for the general game. Specifically, on top, I'm having the spotted cats. Tingana, my favorite leopard. I will try by all means and get hold of him this afternoon. You can talk to us while looking for these animals by following us on YouTube chat stream on hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube chat stream. So I am right by the western side, by the edge of the game reserve, where we have last seen Hukumuri yesterday. I want to see if there are no changes there. As this morning, I was lucky to come across the hyenas coming from this direction, holding a kill. I don't know if the kill was taken down by Hukumuri. And there's also the female tracks, which has been spotted earlier on. And suspicions are linked to Shidulu in the area as Shidulu and Hukumuri, they are always following each other. So I will be looking for those kind of evidence to check if maybe one of these two was not in the area this morning. I'm looking for these two here in the area. Let's kick over to the Masai Mara where David is also looking for the animal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, apologies for Sydney having some technical hitches there. Sometimes these uh, gremlins will come once in a while. We come to all the way from Africa's wilderness and once in a while we get a few challenges to get you to your screens in your living room so you'll forgive us for that it happens once in a while and i was talking earlier of the plans that i got for you today and the plans i have for you today is to look for a particular pride of lions that is called the sausage tree now i want to tell you why we call it the sausage tree because i want to show you how a sausage tree looks like and it's just getting a little bit windy. I'm not sure where this wind came from, but in a few seconds, you'll be seeing a tree, and that tree is what we call a sausage tree. Now, when at the fruits, you can see those fruits hanging down there, or up there rather, they take the shape of a sausage. And that's why we call this tree the sausage tree. Now, the sausage pride, we have been following it for a very long time, and on many occasions, we have found those girls, especially the females of that bride, climbing this particular tree. Not this one in particular, but a similar one tree to this one. Uh, I'm sorry I missed you there, Em. And because they would love either to climb this tree or to stay under the tree because of enjoying its shade, we named that particular pride the Sausage Tree Pride. I hope that makes sense. Well, all our prides here of lions, we'll always name them because of their behavior and very true you're very good and you say to those who look like cucumbers and you remind me of a teacher when i was in high school who could not say cucumber but he kept saying chuchamba and he was a spanish teacher and i think the c and the ch were rather difficult for him to say cucumber and chuchamba well that is how a sausage tree looks like and i was saying we'll name our prides here because of their behavior and also by how they look like. Now, of that pride, there's one particular female that we call the kinkfell, king, king, kinktail, kinktail because she got a split, something like that, on, on her tail. And of course, we have named her the kinktail. Then there's also another particular female in the same pride that when she walks, she limps. 
and we call her Limpy. So depending on their behavior and how they look like, that's how we name our animals. Coach Megan, you're asking whether you can eat the fruit. We can, but we think locally here that fruit does not have any nutrition value. But we've got loads of animals here that will eat that fruit. I'm talking about elephants. I'm talking about giraffes because it's very useful for them for digestion. I highly doubt they get any nutritional values from it, just like us. But locally here in the villages we come from, we'll use the fruit to ferment some local wine. So days we have big celebrations, weddings, or when we have very good harvest and we have you know good crop at the end of the year, we'll always have celebrations. And of course our celebrations is a lot of barbecue meat and a lot of wine drinking. And the wine we make will use that particular fruit to ferment it. But ideally we do not eat it. But again, as I said, giraffes, elephants, and occasionally baboons, we have seen them eating that fruit. And I guess they eat it because it has a lot of fiber in it. Now, this is the tough I love playing. And I would say nine out of the 10 times I've been in this area, I've always found the sausage tree pride. And I'm hoping today will not be a disappointment. It will be similar to what I've been going through. So we'll always keep our eyes open. We, we've got four eyes, mine and arches. And I'm sure Steve in South Africa is equally working very hard. I'm not really working that hard, David. Well, to be honest, the car's driving itself in the riverbed. Well, sausage trees. You want to know about sausage trees, do you? Well, I think all of you viewers are just going to have to tune in tomorrow morning for what is called Medicinal Mondays. And I will be focusing on the one and only sausage tree that we have in Juma Private Game Reserve. Yes? Tomorrow morning. It's a very nice tree. Lots and lots of history behind them and lots and lots of interesting cultural stuff so what I'm doing is we're down in the river I spoke this morning at depth about um, the Katina and the Katina is essentially the soil profile the soil landscape that you find in granitic sandy soils like Juma and essentially the top of the landscape has got large leaves for pumping the water from deep underneath and the mid slope we get the silver cluster leaf band and then it goes further down slope then you get sort of a little bit of a mixed woodland and then some quarries, magic quarries and the like, which then indicate another sea plant and sodic areas. And then you get basically the, the riparian vegetation, which is what we're driving through right now. It's made up of many, many tall trees, habitat trees, jackalberries, leadwoods. Obviously, there's lots of tamboti. Uh, so some of the trees are quite palatable and quite tasty. Some of them are fruit providing. Some of them are extremely poisonous, and extremely toxic, but all of them serve a purpose in the landscape. And the soil here, because you can imagine this was a river, and above it was deposited, and the river's the last thing where the movement happened. Huge amount of deposit that happened here. And actually, just off on my right hand, on my right hand side, you can easily see the underlying granite that has been exposed by the passage of the river. You can see it there, it's quite coarse grained. If you look closely, you'll actually be able to see coarse uh, quartz crystals. There'll be feldspar and possibly some mica. Uh, now, some people believe these granite uh, deposits, well, not deposits, but intrusions, date back about two billion years on the geological time scale. And what has happened above that is that the Earth's sediment, so here came up the magma, because granite is magma, came up from underneath, and the Earth deposited and deposited. There was all of this sediment and above, and the magma stopped there. And what's happened over a very, very long time, this is eroded down, and there we can see it. That was once very deep in the Earth's, underneath the Earth's crust, and now here it is by the river. So you can imagine the sediment that's moved around here and deposited across the landscape has come from far and wide. And so there's all different types of things. But what we get mostly in general down here in the river is this very coarse 
sandy soil. It's not very nutrient rich, uh, but it's quite heavy, so it doesn't move that far. Whereas the clay stuff, much more clay rich soil, which is generally crusted on top of the, 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 the sandy stuff. It's much finer coarse grained. This stuff travels down the landscape, down from the slopes as well, and further down the river than the sand generally does. Sorry, I didn't get that, M. And uh, so essentially you get all different mixtures of nutrients down here, but the soil here is invariably quite deep and there is access to water. Elephants know that. Pihart, there could be gold. Well, not right here. There could be. You, you need to find specific minerals in the soil to know gold. Uh, there's specific minerals that geologists associate with gold. And well, I can't tell you that. Otherwise, I'm giving away a trade secret. I don't honestly know it off the top of my head. But what you get here in this river system is tall trees with very, very deep roots. To be able to as tall as they do, they need to have as much access under the ground as they are capable to grow above ground. So it's very, very commonplace to find really tall jackalberries, really tall leadwoods and the like, sycamore figs. Uh, what else am I missing? Nice big tambourtis. Um, some big apple leaves, even some torchwoods might move down to this drainage system. And uh, well, they are perfect habitat trees. Not only do they stand for a very long time, uh, they obviously create uh, nesting cavities, holes for birds. Uh, obviously, a lot of them are fruiting, so there's feeding for all sorts of monkeys, apes, birds. Many of them also larval food once again for caterpillars and insects. And you look at a tree just like this jackalberry, you can almost imagine that from the root layer underneath the ground all the way to the top branch is a stratification of where different species can occur. Uh, when we look at the top of the catena, the, the trees are, are quite sort of um, homogenous in a way. We get some big marulas, which are very important, but then a few bush willows around, but none of them really get to this sort of size. So there's so much space on a tree like that for the really, really small, the macro level, and obviously things bigger than the macro level feed and it's this whole trophic level that moves up and all of that is caused by this very nice sediment or alluvial soil that we find on the side of the river. And obviously these big trees are aimed at holding the roots and holding the, the soil together and preventing erosion but this is all natural and part and parcel of the geological time we have. And the Mara has got some interesting and sensational geology as well. I thoroughly enjoyed my time up there. Well, there's a very huge difference uh, in almost everything between here and Juma in Sabisans uh, of the Greater Kruger National Park. But number one, as you saw earlier when we started the show, the landscape here, it's more open, it's more vast. We don't have the thick vegetations like, you know, what Steve and Sydney got in South Africa. and. I would say our dominant habitat here is the savanna. Sorry, I lost my hat. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I may have to go back and pick my hat out of the car. Um. <laughs> uh, let me just work up a little bit. It's very windy here. And And I hope everybody sitting there don't go anywhere and that shows the amount of wind we got here. So I have to put this microphone where it should be. That's where my microphone is always hiding. And I think I have to make my heart a little bit smaller. It's pretty windy here. And two days ago I had a haircut. So you can see how I look like. Is that my heart on? Yes. I think I'm back in business now, so I just need to plug in my mic again and I think I'm all set my apologies for that and uh, that was me without a hat and the apologies just getting uh, very windy here and I'm not even sure what I was talking about but I'm trying to think I was talking about the vastness of the Mara and was trying to explain what savanna is so the savanna is an open grassland like this here and in Juma, we have vegetation that's a lot thicker than here. Here in the Mara, you could look straight 
like almost 10 kilometers or let me say you can look all the way straight to the horizon i'm going to give you an example of what i'm talking about and you can see straight all the way to the horizon without what i call visual pollution even a thing you'll see you might only see one tree here or one tree there now just look at that and don't worry about the clouds that doesn't mean we'll have any rains but that is the difference and you can see an elephant miles and miles away and believe you me and i want to challenge steve and sitting on this you will not see that in juma so here you can see an elephant and guess that elephant i'm estimating it to be about what a kilometer or two kilometers away from where we are we have such a powerful camera and apart from that elephant which is i would say giving us a bit of visual pollution and that tree you can see all the way to the horizon so one major difference between juma and uh, the mara triangle how beautiful is that? Some very heavy clouds building up there. We have been going through some rains here over the last few weeks, very heavy rains, which were meant to be the short rains, but to me, they have been like, you know, long rains. And see the beautiful, or the beauty of the savannah. All the trees you see there, we call them the tortured trees. Very iconic here in the Mara and also in Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. So that's one major difference between us and Sebisans, look at that. So like that elephant we picked there, imagine a giraffe walking across there. And for us, I'd say it's a lot easier to also spot cats here than in Juma because we can use our far lookers. I'm talking about our binoculars to look distances and pick them. Of course, they would blend in very well in a place like that. But should they be walking, it's easy also for us to spot them. Should you see vultures, for example, on certain trees like those ones up there, they'll always give us some little clue that there could be some cuts there. So that's the one major difference between where we are and where Steve and Sidney are. But of course, you've got areas that have got forests and some areas also that got cleaves, hills, mountain, rivers, springs, and all those different habitats. Well, that's, I think, it's not very bad for you to have an idea of the habitat that we got in the Mara that are different than in Juma, but I think Steve have gotten himself some kind of predator. Well, indeed we do. This animal has come from somewhere muddy. I'm not sure exactly. Twin Dams is just behind us, and this hyena is drooling a little bit. And I'm not quite sure what it's looking for. It's obviously going to walk straight behind us now. It almost thinks like maybe it's anticipating to see somebody. I wonder. Their sense of smell is very acute. And you can probably... I'm just going to move back there, Darby. Get you a nice shot. Sorry, folks. I'm just going to have to start the vehicle to move back. I've got a little bit of a leadwood tree behind me here. Through the gap. Now we often find hyenas leading us to predators and for them to be up and mobile at this time of day it is 33 degrees Celsius, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, it is warm. Obviously he's enjoying himself with a little bit of mud. Hello Noel, this is your second favorite animal. What is your favorite animal? Hyenas are very interesting. I wouldn't say they're my favorite animal. I find them absolutely fascinating but they're not my favorite. They're just really intriguing. I find their behavior and everything about them really, really interesting. Okay, well, I think we go back around into the drainage there, Darby. What do you reckon? Let's see what that animal's up to. Because it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be on a little bit of a mission. We are making our way slowly to the little chief, Osana. We'll see if he's still there. I'm pretty sure he will be at some point, if not there, right now maybe he came all the way here to twin dams for a drink this is a place i've we found him many times i do think though he was closer to chitwa so if i were him i would have gone to chitwa you know the water is a lot cleaner that side and we just go back down into this little drainage line And so James Richard has confirmed that those butterflies were in fact called African vagrants, which um, 
I'm not too too sure how how familiar they are, but they surely are in huge abundance at the moment. Obviously, all the eggs hatching at the same time. We did find a lot of their caterpillars out on the um, on the peanut butter cassia on one of the bushwalks. Apparently, those were African vagrants, and well, they have certainly become butterflies very very quickly. And well, we know that a lot of the birds that have come down from Europe or Africa. Most of the cuckoos, all the cuckoos are specifically caterpillar feeders. That's what they eat. And well, all those caterpillars feeding on all these ginormous larval trees. If you have a look at this tree here, you can see how all the end of the leaves have been eaten. And that is from the larval stage, probably from many, many caterpillars, absolutely stripping this jackalberry to the bones. That is what happens. Sorry, Darby. We're just going to quickly move around and see if we catch up with this very dirty hyena. But in the meantime, an animal that enjoys the water or the mud as much as the hyena is with a... Is with, is with Sydney. Sorry. You can see I've got one of those big animals which can be able to live in both water and on land. During the day, mostly, you will see him in water. Soon as the sun goes down, you will see him outside going for some foraging purposes. These kind of animals, unfortunately, they are not carnivores, they are herbivores. They've got big body sizes, which needs quite a lot of grass, nutritious grass maintenance. And the nutritious grass, for them to get hold of them, they've got to travel long distances, which can cover 16 to 30 kilometers every night, according to the availability of food. So you can see some of the bears are also feeding on him at the moment. They are cleaning some of the old dead tissues around the wounds, while at the same time, they're also picking up some of the ticks. So these hippos can be able to sometimes get rid of these ticks when they are rolling in mud and scratch against the trees. But that is not enough. Some of the areas are inaccessible. The birds got to come and play a very important role. So the oxpeckers are helping a lot these kind of animals. Yes, they do also absorb quite a lot of blood when they are cleaning uh, these kind of animals. But animals, they do get quite a lot of benefit from these kind of animals. Why? Because the dead tissues and everything will then cause infections and some of the things will also attract the flies. It's very rare to see these animals followed by the flies because these birds, they are always there. And just think about the design of the hippo tail. If the hippo has got that kind of a tail, which cannot even reach anywhere, these birds are playing a very important role when it comes to the cleaning of the hippopotamus. He's just lying down on the side now, you can see that. Oh, now he's becoming active. He's just changing the side. Look at that. This is beautiful. The nose is underwater. You can just be able to hold the breath for just about approximately five to six minutes. They look very much calm, but I can promise you a hippopotamus is one of those animals which can be very much potential dangerous when he is on land. They are very territorial and they can be very much aggressive. So this hippopotamus we are seeing here has been seen quite a lot just all by himself. He's one of the solitary hippos. He is not part of any school around here at the moment as the hippopotamus are residing by the Chita Chita water hole. <laughs> Scuba Steve is very much popular by that gnome. So the scuba Steve is a very best friend of my colleague Steve. Let's see another Steve. Very nice link sitters, much better than my last one. A little bit of a tongue twister. Anyway, we've managed to track this hyena and it's got what looks to be a spy. Oh, David's water bottle just exploded. It seems to be a vertebrate. And very hard for me to tell you what animal. But hyena, and of course it's very, very muddy and very dirty. Hyena are known to cache their certain carcasses and bones in water and in muddy wallows. 
to retrieve later. And it does seem like it is a bit dirty, doesn't it, Darby? Maybe he went in to go and find it somewhere and it's not come off quietly to eat. Definitely desperate times lead to de desperate measures. Seems to be a female hyena. No, it looks it looks absolutely disgusting, but that is the role of hyena in the landscape, to break very very powerful bones, uh, and well to get the nourishment out of them. And it's one of the reasons why hyena can lactate for as long as they do to provide the necessary milk, very nutrient rich milk for their their pups or cubs, due to the fact that um, they get so much bone in their diet. And, well, in the Mara and here, the animals are able to feed on bones long into seasons when food is a bit more scarce and can really maximize the, the animal itself. Whereas lion and leopard, they have to leave so much behind. And the hyena, that's why we regard them as a scavenger down here. They are very big scavengers up in the Mara though. Very, very versatile hunters as we have seen. But they will often also feed on bone because they can and so whenever you find an animal feeding on bone you must think ah oh, it's stolen it from someone or it's feeding on the scraps well that's because the scraps are there and why go and hunt when you've got food in the fridge or well, in this case in the muddy water pond to make it go rank very good you can hear the sound it is very powerful Power, most powerful jaw bite of all the predators for their body size and they've got a very long ridge on the top of their head for attachment of those powerful muscles nice please feel free ladies and gentlemen to send through your questions and comments hashtag safari live let us know how you're doing and well also send through, through some comments we'd love to hear from you also you can throw them on the YouTube chat stream right now we're on that sort of little level area that leads down to the river so the tree vegetation here it's quite bushy uh, the, the river Rhine area as it sort of goes from a bit more open area to a bit more thickets this is the habitat of impala the edge specialists and the nyala in the edges itself inside the thickets dacre as well through archer and this is the area that the leopards love to frequent because obviously all those animals are their primary food source and well they like to hide in the thickets and that's why how they've evolved to um, camouflage themselves in because the habitat they've evolved in is how they have learned how to survive. And the hyena obviously being the most versatile of the hyena day, occurring in many many um, landscapes across the continent, being very very dominant over their counterparts, the spotted or sorry the striped hyena which occurs north of their location and then also out competing the brown hyena, hyena when they do occur in the same area. Aardwolf as well, part of the family, not a carnivore though, completely at the mercy of the very socially structured hyena. Well, it seems like surf is up at Bifflesook Watering Hole, and let's go see who's riding the wave. So you can see that uh, Scuba Steve has got some beneficiaries. <laughs> you can see the terrapin is now climbing on top of uh, the hippopotamus uh, in order to enjoy him or herself. You can see the very long neck which is coming out. That is one of uh, the features uh, you can use in order to distinguish between the turtles and the terrapins. So the tortoise, they withdraw their head sideways, whereas the tortoise, they withdraw their back uh, straight and the tortoise can be able to hide it deep inside the shell. So both uh, tortoise and terrapins, they've got strong shells. 
So you can see that only one is coming out at the moment. But sometimes you find Scuba Steve with quite a lot of tortoise on top of him, a lot of uh, terrapins on top of him. It's pretty relaxed. So I just want to see what is going to happen. I can hear those birds, the oxpeckers still flying in the area, if they're going to go back again and join the, to the terrapin. You can see he's not worried. It means there is a nice dependency between these two. <laughs> and this is a very much cute. Oh, have you seen that? <laughs> well, I've just said it now. Have you seen how that terrapin dived back into the water hole for safety? <laughs> so that terrapin just dropped when that oxpecker was landing. I hear the oxpeckers making noise up in the air and then one of them dived back, was not even worried about the terrapin. And the terrapin just went back to the water hole. So they're back again trying to uh, clean the wounds. So this hippopotamus is looking very much small there, but I can promise you when this hippo is out, you won't believe it's so huge, can be up to 1,700 kilograms. Now let's go to the real Steve from Scuba Steve. Thanks, it is. Well, we're not far away. Or well, should I say, you're in the north of Juma, we right in the south. Twin dams, your bifuzuk. We're still with this hyena, and if we have a listen, let's see if we can hear the bones crunching. They're very powerful jaws, and they don't even need to use the side of their jaw, the side of the teeth, the carnassial shear that you find in all predators. The hyena's molars on the side, which are very, very sharp and very bone crushing extremely powerful and are regarded as the strongest teeth in nature. Uh, crocodiles are able to replace their teeth, hyena are not. So they need to be able to crush bones for most of their life to be able to survive. It's one of the reasons that they are able to survive in so many diverse habitats. What have we got? Oh, guys, have a look at what we've just found. I told you the little chief will just come and say hello. He'll just come and say hello. Barbara, I'm sorry, I'm going to answer your question in a minute. But Hosanna has decided to come and um, give this hyena a spanking. And um, this is awesome. Barbara, hyenas bo uh, <laughs> scat is white because of the bone in the diet. When they drop their scat, it actually is green and it goes white as it, as it sort of calcifies and dries. So that is a testament to the amount of... David was just like, come on, turn around, Steve. And I was like, why? And here's Osana. He's... I told you he was going to come and say hello, didn't I? He's... He was on his way to come and drink at Twin Dams, and he heard the crunching. Okay, so there's a couple other people that were looking for Osana. They've gone to the sighting. So I'm just going to quickly let them know while you enjoy watching this beautiful creature come in a bit closer. I'm going to actually keep quiet for a second because this could be interesting. Darby, I'm going to stay right where I am, eh? Okay, let's see what happens here. Asana thinks the hyena's got something he wants, but it's a vertebrae, not what he wants. One word tweet, everybody. What do you think about this? Let's see if he's going to give him a hiding. I'm not going to start the car. I think invite some people on board, most certainly, Emma. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you from Juma Private Game Reserve in South Africa, where we stumbled across a hyena it was busy feeding on probably some very old bones that it had cached. My name is Steve, I'm joined by Davis on camera. And we were actually planning on going out this afternoon to look 
for this male leopard who has just stumbled across us. We were talking about our hina and the color of their dung. And well, there's a leopard, my favorite little leopard, the little chief, who's now gonna suddenly realize that the bones that he is uh, about to look at are actually really gross and only capable of being broken by a jaw from a hyena of that ilk. My hyena had absolutely no idea. Hello, Osanis, hello to everybody. If you have questions, comments, throw them in on the chat stream below. Love to hear from you. Hello, Papa, you think he's hungry? Well, we found him this morning on a Steenbok kill. And, um, well, people have gone in that direction to see if they can find him. We decided to follow the hyena because we thought maybe it would lead us to Osana or to something of interest. And, well, <laughs> it did indeed. It did indeed lead us there. How awesome is that? Well, I just love this guy. He is such a character. He knows we've got a TV show this evening and he wants to be a superstar. Here he is. Look at that beautiful face. Now, he's probably going to go to the dam and have a drink. That's really crazy to have them walking at this time of day. Ricardo, I think most people's favorite feline is a leopard. Definitely. Well, we're going to see if we can follow him. I think that action for the hyena is over. He's going to go down and have a drink. We're going to see if we can keep up, keep up with him. There were some Nyala just over here that we saw, so maybe. He's still here. Em is right here in the thicket, and he looks like he's spotted something. We did have some Nyala that we saw just before we came up here. We had a very nice little, little pathway into the bushes here. It is 33 degrees Celsius, about 83 Fahrenheit. And well, to find a leopard moving around in this time of day, he must be very thirsty. I don't think he's stalking, but he might. There were some Nyala on our way up, as I said, and well, he is definitely spotting something over there. We're just above a dry riverbed, so this is the perfect habitat for the camouflaged um, Nyala, Daker, and Bushbuck. The edges are also quite commonly used by Impala, and well, it's the perfect habitat for a stalking cat. Rima, no, he's not limping, he's just, he was stalking. He was doing the leopard walk. Doing the leopard walk. Oh, he's just in the thickets there, I'm not getting the best view of him. Let's move up. Let's see if we can get another look. Oh, breathtaking indeed. Well, we are super blessed with this superstar of a cat. Well, that's that last view we're gonna have to get of him now. His ears are flat though. He's definitely having a look at something that might just be down the drainage here. We definitely will be able to get around in a moment. Remember folks, this is coming to 100% live from the Greater Kruger National Park in Juma. And well, please, we would love to hear from you. Just throw any comments or questions down below. Hosanna, the little chief. Mm, Linda, you are spot on there. He is a very beautiful cat. And well, he is definitely on the move now. Look at the body language, the body posture changing. Hello, Ruth. Uh, leopards, male leopards, normally between 10 and 13 is a good good age for a male leopard due to the competition that they experience. Uh, females can live up to 15, maybe even a little bit more in the wild. Uh, in captivity, they have been known to live much longer due to the fact that there's not as much fighting and danger. But out here, we've got a male leopard, his father, who's in his 13th year. Uh, we thought he was ailing earlier this year and he sprung right back again. So and there's another female who's 12. So that's, you don't generally, I've never come across, generally come across leopards that are older than that in the wild. But um, there are always, always cases that it might happen. But he definitely looks like he's interested in something that's just there in the thicket. I'm gonna see if I can just get around here. There's a little bit of a clearing just around the corner, Dave. Mouse, you want to know if leopards and hyenas generally come cl close? Well, essentially, oh, I think I've got a stump in front of me. I'm going to have to go back. Mouse, what we find here is that the hyena follow the leopards around. 
and there's a huge competition between the two for food resource for, for obviously they feed on very similar food and the leopard being a very good hunter often Hosanna has lost out to his prey via hyena his dad though steals a lot more of it as well so he's a very young leopard he's only turning three in February and well he's done very well this year we've had an absolutely incredible year with him okay, still looking very intently into the bushes there Georgia yes most certainly those powerful jaws of the hyena which are designed for crushing and breaking bone if he bit Hosanna on the leg broke a leg broke a ligament did any damage to him physically could lead to his starvation a leopard that cannot climb a tree will not be able to hunt will not be able to escape predators will not be able to hoist their kills so essentially could lead to their demise so essentially leopards which are on a weight level more powerful than a hyena from a physicality point of view one bite from a hyena could lead to his death in the long run so they avoid them if they can um, but leopards develop sort of a reputation with hyena and we've seen him many many times running from them and he's starting to really stand up for himself when it comes to one hyena but when there's more than one well then he generally turns tail and runs because that's just an unfair fight Rena, myself and Hassan are very stealthy. Well, I try. I can't say I'm as stealthy as this young dude is. He snuck up on us there. I had no idea he was coming. He was sneaking up on the hyena. Just goes to show how brazen he is. He wasn't bothered with one hyena there. He thought he might be able to steal some food from it. But what has he spotted? Look at the excitement. Look at the excitement of his, uh, his tail there. Ruth, you want to know if this is in color? This is in 100% color. We are in the summer months. We've had some rainfall. Watch out, folks. He looks like he's about to launch. We're just going to stay right here for a second. Ah, Yala just alarm called. Did you hear that bark? Dear Moor, he's definitely bulking up. There's the Yala. They've spotted him. Oh, silly boy. You've been spotted. That's one thing he needs to work on his stealth and well his patience. Well, he's with the Nyala that we saw before. And well, he's now going to walk very nonchalantly past them. As if he didn't care in the world at all. Well, folks, as for Sana goes down to the watering hole to have a drink, the Nyala seem to be safe for the moment. I hope you've enjoyed this little moment with us. Please feel free. We are still live for another hour or so. Just Google Safari Live. Thanks for your questions and comments, and we'll see you next time. Have a good day. Welcome back everybody. I just need to um, let the other gentleman that I'm working with this morning, this afternoon, know that we have managed to find the little chief and also try not put Darby into this little knob thorn. Station, so uh, we've relocated on Hosanna and he's mobile towards Twin Dams. That'll get people excited. Uh oh, not going off there. Okay, well, we had a muddy hyena with some very disgusting looking bones. The little chief on his way to drink, and well, Sydney has got a hyena of his own. Uh, you can see that I've got the lovely hyena who is now just having a mud bath. This hyena just got into this water now, just about a minute ago. We found him lying down under a very nice shade. But you can see that he's multitasked. He's inside there, but the nose is still getting information from the air particles. This is what the hyenas mostly do when it's too hot. At the moment, the sun is increasing a little bit. Yes, now it's towards the sunset, but it's still very much warm here where I am at the moment. So hyenas also early in the mornings, you will see them going to the water holes. 
<laughs> Indeed, this is a brilliant moment. Look at that. You will see them, hyenas, in the morning chasing each other, playing inside the water holes as well. Hyenas, they eat carrions. And it's not very often that you will see, you will pick them up with that kind of a distinctive smell from those carrions because they come and bath. So they bath all the time. You can see this whole body is right deep there. So this must be helping them as well in order to get rid of the parasites. So high infestation of the parasite gives these animals a problem, specifically when there is shortage of water, as dehydration can be a very serious threat to the animals. The ticks do absorb quite a lot of blood from the animals, and because of that, they experience dehydration. So, so far I'm just seeing just one hyena. Uh, Connie, I haven't seen the albino hyena at the moment. The only animal white I have seen before it was an impala which was completely white and I've also seen a zebra without the stripes as well and obvious the white lions. White lions, I saw that it is caused by what is called leucism, the disappearance of the melanistic pigment, the pigment which is responsible to give these colors the dark colors. It's like trees. Trees, for them to get these green leaves, they are relying on what is called a chlorophyll pigment. So pigments, they play a very significant role in order to create these beautiful spots and colors we are seeing on these animals. These hyenas from the Juma clan, they do compete a lot with some of the predators, such as this one. have um, managed to relocate on the little chief. And um, I think I need to get a hold of Sydney for some good news. I just heard something on the radio that he will very likely be able to go to Warts. So I know everybody would be very excited as well. Just need to, I'm not going to tell you any more than that. And we've got the little chief busy drinking. And well, how amazing was that, that he just, we were looking at a hyena, talking about poo, as we do, and David's like, look behind you, there, there. I thought he wanted me to look at the camera, and there was the little chief stalking the hyena, how magnificent. So when I was discussing earlier about thinking Chitto was closer as a drinking point, um, maybe he prefers this area due to him knowing it better. Maybe he doesn't like the, the guests in room 11. Any more of Chitwa. Haven't seen um, Osana on that side in some time. Although he does know it quite well. Maybe he's getting a bit more brave and he wants to come back again to try and compete against Hukumuri. Yes, please. If you could, uh, just, I mean, I'm sure Sydney's on the radio there. If you can just chat to him about the access this afternoon, Emma, that would be great. A very thirsty cat. We've seen, we often see leopards drink. I don't think they've got the most well-adapted drinking technique. There's a lot of mess that goes on there. Lots of drool. But marvellous to be seeing them moving at this time of day. I really didn't anticipate him to be up and about in the heat. Well, I'm sure you're all, you're all happy to hear that David and I intend to stay with him for as long as possible. We called him in on the radio and um, the people who were interested in finding him couldn't find him at his little spot before. They've moved off. Uh, to the north so they are preoccupied with other sightings so I absolutely love the fact that sometimes we can be with a leopard all on our own 
absolutely magical. And the little chief is the most magical of them all. It really is special, folks, to be able to spend time in the life of a cat and doing what they do. Many other reserves you might go to uh, have leopard, um, but they're not habituated. Wild, skulking animals that are very, very hard to see because they're very observant and very, what's the word, aware. And a leopard that doesn't want to be seen, well, will not be seen. Right here is where I had him come and lie next to us one day. <laughs> Sorry, I turned the wrong way, Darby. Sorry, Emma, Bubble Girl said something there. I didn't quite get it. Are you going to come sit in my shade? The shade's behind, boy. Oh, Bubble Girl, no, that water certainly is not clean. Um, but the animals out here are well adapted to drinking water that's quite, um, quite rancid. Okay, Hosanna, are you going to go up there? There was some Opala on the other side of the damn wall here. Let's go and see if he's still hungry. After that drink, he might just plop down in the shade. But he's probably going to... Okay, well, while we get up and see if he's going to chase some hyena now, some Impala, let's go back to Sidders and his hyena. So the hyena is enjoying uh, himself at the moment as we even saw him falling asleep at one stage deep in this little water hole. The water hole was not created by the hyena. This is a natural water hole. Why am I saying it's a natural water hole? Because it's as a result of the elephants. This has been done by the animals. Let's quickly go to Hosanna. Yes, well, this could go on all day, folks. Once he starts hunting, he never stops. You can see the impala on the right of the screen there. Hosanna is flat. A couple of impala there. He's looking. He's trying to pick up the shape. That's why when a leopard goes up a little ridge or termite mount, their ears go flat. They change the shape of their body. And that's one of the characteristic signs when you're looking in the bush uh, for cats when you're walking is you often see this little head pop up. He's going to go to the right. He's going to try and find another spot. There he comes. Hello, boy. Are you going to go around? Now the brain is going, okay, where am I going to go? Let me think about this. <laughs> I think those impala are going to be too wily for them. They, they kind of have an idea. They probably heard the bushbuck earlier and are on the alert. Our impala are well known to be what I said before, edge specialists. So they like to be on sort of the edge of the thicket. Sorry about my head there. On the edge of the thicket with some open clearing on the outside. So they'll spend the night and sort of cooler periods in the open. And well, when it's hot, they'll go into the shaded areas and feed on the browse and ruminate there. And it also means that they're able to be a bit more detective of a leopard if it does happen to come past. He's going to go all the way around the dam wall, get onto the thickets that side and maybe see if he can try his luck. So there was a question before about the cleanliness of the water. These watering holes are accumulated over a period of time. All sorts of algae and organic material is in there. And it's not ideal. If we drank it, we'd probably get quite sick. Uh, but animals out here have got a very, very well adapted stomach. Uh, we, should I say, filter our water and are way too sanitary. So our gut enzymes that would normally be good at digesting and dealing with whatever's in that water, well, we've long and truly lost that in the process of what we call civilization. Leopards and animals out here have been drinking very, very rancid water for a very long time. And the ones that are weak, well, they don't survive. The ones that are strong live to drink another day. Okay, well, while he moves over to that side, let's see if we can reverse back and go get him before we lose sight of him. Wonderful is this, eh? Oh, he's going into a little cave. Are you going to hide in the cave? <laughs> Here's your reverse back. Yeah, this is exactly where I had him once kill a, kill a scrub, eh? And then he sat down and where we were parked with him just now, he was drinking right there, looking at me as only Hosanna knows how to look. Very, very special animal that we have here. See these impala, see how alert they are. 
Yes, he is on a mission today. I wonder what's going on. I mean, I think he's still quite unsettled after yesterday. I'm no doubt. See, those impala males are a little bit far out the way there, and then the open. I don't think there's any chance of Hosanna catching them. There lots of boys together. And well, yeah, he's going to do exactly what I anticipated. He's going to hang out in the shade. So I think he's still a little bit shaken. He's just down over here. We'll go and get another view of him in a second once we link away, but let's just re-establish him there again. But I think he did have a bit of an interaction with Hukumuri, and well, he's going to stay a little bit further south from where Hukumuri hung out. I had anticipated yesterday maybe finding him around Treehouse Dam, which is a little bit more west from where we are now. Uh, finding him here now is not really a surprise. He does know this area quite well. There's water, abundance of game to come down. Uh, Hukumuri went and moved past Vuetela Pan, which has been Hosanna's haunt for so long. So I think he's a bit unsettled of the drooling, evil stare of the Hukumuri himself. But anyway, someone who spent most of the yesterday afternoon with the Hook himself was Sydney. It was fantastic yesterday seeing Hukumuri by the western side of the game reserve as we haven't seen him for quite a long time and something else is that now I am planning to make my way much more towards the torch wood there I might be lucky with one of those leopards we haven't seen for quite a long time I'm talking about the leopards such as Tandi, leopards such as Kalamba those ones I know these days are concentrating much more that side I have seen Kalamba a few days ago but Tandi it has been a while So let's hope I find one of those animals or all of those animals by the good network access areas. As Torchwood, I know my only challenge there is poor network access. But it doesn't matter, I will go there. So I'm just, <laughs> I am also very much excited about going to Torchwood. I love going there because uh, it's a completely different environment. We have been to Juma quite a lot. We know all these areas and we do see these animals a lot, but it's good at least to go there and try something else. So I am now driving past Central and still no tracks of Tingana. Maybe he's always maybe he's also in the very same area where I'm heading to. So I will be trying to hit two birds with one stone. As I indicated on my introduction, today I'm looking for a general game. Could be the lions or the lepers. Any updates I'm going to follow. David has got one of those lions interested in climbing a one favorite tree. Very good luck, Sydney. Hopefully, you're gonna get a spotted cut because I already got my spotless cuts here. I'm not sure that calls a spotless cut, and that one is having a huge stretch. And this is the sausage tree pride. Uh, for those of you who could be joining us now, this is the pride I was looking for, and it was my main mission when I left the camp this afternoon. I am full of joy to have found them and I want to stay with them for a couple of minutes and find out exactly what they do. I got four females here, those two that you just saw, and this one here. I've gathered they're trying to hunt, and what I just guess they're hunting is not anything I can see. And <coughs> my apologies, it's a bit uh, windy here, and I think I'm picking all the allergens and pollen from the grass. I got a feeling they want to hunt a warthog because I can't see the prey. The only sizable animal I would think they would be looking for is a pig. 
and most likely they won't hunt a warthog that I can't see. It is somewhere. So that female there is like leading the pack and she's ahead of everybody and what I guess she want to do is to go around the warthog and maybe push it towards the other three. Well, that's my thinking. I'm sure the lionesses have a different plan. Who knows what they're thinking? And those two have stayed on that talent mound and they're definitely in touch. They're in communication of some sort. And remember, our drive is very interactive. So should you have any questions or comments, please send them through using hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. She just turned back to look at the cabs because the cabs are not very far from where they are. And I'm sure you know this particular pride got three cabs and they have been told to stay put, don't move, stay somewhere, keep playing until we let you know. So got those two there and that one in front there. And there's one more, I don't know where she is, because there should be four, but when the pride is together, there are always five females. And the fifth female that is missing, I could be wrong, but I think she could be somewhere trying or dropping her young ones. We saw her last night and her belly was bulging. She had a very big belly. And I'll be surprised today or tomorrow, or maybe last night, she dropped her cubs, which will be another generation. Could say that you like to with the lions hang around the camp. Yes, they do. And you know what? They also just hunt next door. A few weeks ago, they brought down a zebra about 300 meters from my tent. Yes. I had lots of movement that night and I wasn't sure and I thought I was dreaming because I just had something being strangled. Initially, there was some huge movement and a lot of running. And then, yes, Elm says that's really crazy. And then the, the, the chase was towards or between the camp and a little clinic we have for the staff there. And what we saw the following morning was the zebra that was brought down. Of course, the lions were gone. They know. I mean, their lions are equally intelligent. They know people live there. They can see the camps. They can see the tent. So they left. And we had hyenas then the following night because the hyenas couldn't come during the day. So, yes, I mean, we think we are the visitors. We came where the lions live. So we do not blame them when they come to the camp. But, yes, they come close. And the times we have taken pictures of uh, lion print just outside, like 10, 10 15 meters outside your tent. So that happens many times. The only thing is we'll always have flashlights. When you go out, make sure you use your flashlight. If you don't have one, use your ears. If you don't, you know, use your eyes nicely. If you see anything moving, be very careful. But yes, they do come and you can't blame them. There's one particular pride that lives very close to where we are and it's called the Ololola Pride. This particular pride, for those of you who are joining us now, is called the Sausage Tree Pride five females at the moment, uh, three cubs. The fifth female is not here and we think, or I personally think, should be somewhere going to the maybe labor ward to bring down her cubs. Two males have been hanging around with these girls here that are called the Old Donya Pike. There's a coalition of two males which we think are the father of the cubs. The cubs have been left a little bit behind by these females because they've got plants to hunt and cubs being cubs they might interfere with the hunting strategy so they have to be left behind so that these females can do exactly what they want. So these lionesses I can tell you they are hungry and definitely either now or later tonight or much later tomorrow morning they might be going for a prey to feed themselves. It's not only these lionesses that are hungry because even Hosanna is equally hungry. Thanks Gigi. Well we are indeed with Hosanna and he is sitting in the open. You spoke earlier about we wouldn't see a lep an elephant walking through the open here. Well, I'd hope you could find a leopard walking through the open where you are, because that is what we see commonplace here. Obviously, we don't see elephants too often moving through the open area. They like to be in thickets where they feel quite comfortable. But we do have Hosanna, and he is lying flat here by the dab. He eats. He's eaten probably all of his steenbok because no one has reported that there is anything on site but we might follow him back if he goes back to see exactly whereabouts he might be going but the fact that he is hunting is just testament to the curiosity 
and opportunistic behavior that these animals have. Becky, I have no idea about my, what might have happened. What I do know is that people went to go and try and find him and couldn't find him. There was no report of the kill in the tree and no report of another leopard on scene. Uh, so it's possible he just got thirsty and he came down to drink. Um, I really don't know. It's one of those things in the bush here that the mystery just continues. But he's very hot. You can see him panting quite deliberately now. He's digesting his food, pushing the diaphragm up. So he's not starving. Not at all starving. Panting away. Very nice. Hello Simon and Yala. You want to know how long a leopard can survive without water? Well probably the same as us. Probably just a few days uh, before dehydration kicks in. Um, but you know, all mammals have the need to drink water regularly. They can probably go for, I don't know, three, four days. We could probably go for that as well before we had any real major side effects. Um, but essentially leopards live in an area where there is water. They will not spend time far away from water. But what they can do is they can get a lot of their moisture from the blood from animals that they do kill. That's one of the things that they can get. But the blood is also quite salty. So invariably, even though it might add the moisture that they need, uh, if you've ever eaten something salty, it generally leads you to get quite thirsty. So it's often you find leopards after eating something, they come and drink. Lions are the same. And well, they'll drink until they're full. But um, water is very important for all mammals. We were born in a placenta, surrounded by water. And we are completely dependent on it for the rest of our lives. Well, there are only a few mammal species in the world that are really, really well adapted to surviving with very low amounts of water. And while a leopard needs to scent mark, they urinate a proper urine stream. And just like us, they have no modified kidneys for a sort of storing or sort of soaking out any of the moisture like most birds and reptiles do. Or well, all birds, I suppose. No uric acid is secreted instead of urine. They need moisture to keep their body processes going. Eagle Scouts, I can't even see the lion injury. Um, I remember the story happening, but I haven't seen any markings on him. He is looking absolutely gorgeous. Look at him. Doesn't he look like a little cuddly toy you could just go and cuddle up to, Dave? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He is ridiculous. <laughs> And folks, if this is your first time watching, this is a 100% live wild leopard. Absolutely wild. He is turning three years old in February. And we're all going to have a really big party. Aren't we, Darby? Oh, yes. yeah, we don't need any excuses. But for the little chief, we'll have a big party in the name for him. We'll make a cake and he could eat it. We might make a Steenbock pie for him. I think he might like a Steenbock pie. <laughs> and we'll even bottle a little bit of Twin Dam's water for him. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get that, Emma. Something about candles. He's dreaming now of his birthday. Horn candles. Yeah, yeah, of course. Some in pile of horns and maybe steambok horns. Yeah, can peg them into the table. You can come blow them out. I wouldn't be surprised if he arrived for his birthday. I mean, look how he just materialized behind Dave and myself. He has a knack of doing that, you know, folks. He has a knack of just materializing. Uh, we've got Herbie out on foot. He went to go see if he could find Hosanna after someone couldn't find him. He was trying to track him. Another vehicle was interested to find him. And, well, we decided to follow our hyena. And as we sat <laughs> with the hyena, Hosanna just pops out behind, which he does so many times before. Beautiful. Beautiful. I just need to give a quick update on the radio. Yes, he is gorgeous and he is really filling out. Now that I've spent a few days with him, really starting to see the size of the neck there, the head, the sort of that sort of that area behind the ears, the sort of top neck is really, really firming out. 
Uh, he's still got a bit of growth to do. Um, his, his tracks are really nice and big, um, but I'm not sure how big he is compared to Hukumuri at the moment. Hukumuri is not a big leopard. He's stocky, but he's not tall. Um, I find Tingana to be a bigger looking leopard, and well, this is the product of Tingana. And I'm sure he is going to be a very fine young, he is a really fine young man. The nicest gentleman out here, isn't he, Darby? Okay, well, we are not going anywhere, folks. We're going to see what silliness he gets up to. There's some nice cloud cover pulling in to cool us down. And in the meantime, let's go up to the Sausage Tree Republic with David and the Sausage Tree Pride. Because I have also stayed here with the Sausage Tree Pride. Now, this is one particular female on top of this Taman Mount. Not sure what she is looking at because they seem or they seem to have given up on that warthog. Either the warthog went too far, and uh, in general, lions and or lionesses are not as fast runners as they so Maybe if they calculate and they think it's not worth the hunt or the energy they're gonna burn trying to chance on the warthog, then they miss it. They thought, you know what, just forget it. Now, this is the fourth member of these five girls. We've got four, and if you look at that one carefully, just a slight limp. So we call this one here the limpy. We got limpy there, and she looks up, not sure what she is looking at, and limpy got one cub with her. can see the much better and possibly go close to the calves which are not very far from here. This lioness is to me, they look hungry and I'm sure at one point they must do some hunting today. So as I try to get close to the calves, let's go back to Steve Oval who still got her son with him. Welcome back, and we do apologize about the technical issues faced up in the Mara. The Sausage Tree Republic has not always got the best signal. And, well, hopefully David will manage to get those lions to hunt in an area that is a little bit more sort of signal friendly. Bearing in mind, we are streaming a live internet show to you viewers all over the world, wherever you might be sitting and watching. And, well, we're coming to you from Juma in the South Africa Sabi Sands and in the Maasai Mara Triangle up in Kenya. Quite an amazing feat. Do not ask me more about that information because all I know is that there is a metal rod on the back of my vehicle with machines inside the car that make a little bit of noise and that is all I can tell you. The rest is left up to those, those tech geniuses we have around. Are you looking at the goose, Osana? That will be funny. That would be funny. If you're looking at that one Egyptian goose, is that a meal? Would you like to catch yourself some goose for for New Year's? Hello, Chili Pepper. Okay, well, if he stops moving, we might, might be able to show you. Chili Pepper, you're a new viewer. Welcome to the show. Uh, leopards have got spot patterns on their face, which if... Oh, okay. <laughs> there he goes. Let me show you, I've got a picture on, on, on my book here that I can actually show you. Okay, so when we look at leopards, we look at this, see they've got whisker patterns here. We look at this top line over here, there's no whiskers coming out. We look on either side of the face and we get a spot pattern. So this would be a two and I can't see the other side there, but maybe a two. Um, Hosan has got a three and a three pattern on his face. He's got a very pink nose and he is a male. Um, so we know our leopards here quite well. Obviously in the beginning, it takes a bit of getting used to when you identify them. Uh, Tingan is a bit more raggedy. He's got a bit of a longer face. He's much older, obviously, than Hosanna, and he is a male as well. So males are much bigger than females. At a first glance, if you are a new viewer or a new person to the bush, it's quite tricky to identify a male versus a female leopard. But when you look at the neck, the neck of the lady, think about it, is always very nice and elegant, nice and slim and elegant. And, well, they are actually much smaller 
then the males. Hosanna, a few months ago, well, it was quite tricky to ID him as a male because he didn't, hadn't really filled out that much at the time, and his neck was also quite sort of thin. Um, but he is slowly developing the size of his father, and uh, each leopard has got almost a unique spot pattern. Um, and you can also then look at marks on the ears, scratches on the face, and, well, nose sometimes pink, black, or spotted, all of these things. We've got some viewers even that are able to identify these cats by their bottom, which I find absolutely incredible. With uh, certain pictures of the leopard walking away, you can basically get just a little pattern on anywhere that kind of stands out to you. And then with that, you can see he's also got a couple of little crooks in his ear there. Well, what a nice spot you're in if the Impala come down to drink. He knows it. He's like, wow, I've never been here before. That's a good spot. And so over time, you can identify them. It takes a bit of practice, but um, once you've identified a few and you know what area you're in, you can generally start identifying more and more. But the little chief is a superstar. His face is on the magazine of many, <laughs> on many magazines around the world. I only joke. But uh, many of our viewers have been watching the show for a long time. Hosanna, being almost three, has been on screen almost every day for the last three years. So he's well known to many people, as is Tandi and Tingana and Hosanna's mom, Karula. They're very well known and very popular cats. And their images are burnt into history with many of our viewers who love these animals to death. And we do as well. Definitely very special. I mean, look how camouflaged he is there, hiding in the little hole. Hello, Holly. Do you want to know what I mean when I talk about sawing? Well, Holly, have you ever gone into your dad's workshop and he's got a big saw and he cuts a plank of wood? I don't want to do it too loud because I don't want to scare him. But basically, when you do the plank of wood, you, you pull it like this and it makes a <coughs> kind of sound. And that is what we call sawing. It's something that the panthera genus can do. Lions are able to roar. Leopards saw. A jaguar, I think, does something quite similar. I've never heard when a tiger does something in that regard as well. And that's adaptation to the voice box and sort of ligaments around the lung and in the chest that enable them this boom box effect, uh, which is designed for territorial marking and also for the attraction of mates. So... The sawing is an immediate sort of sign of the animal's presence. And Hosanna, still too young to be sawing. It might possibly be a testosterone thing, a maturity thing. Uh, but it's generally only practiced by animals that are trying to claim a territory. And for now, the little Hosanna, the little chief, is hanging out within his dad's territory and trying not to attract too much unwanted attention. Yesterday, we believe he nearly had a close call with Hukumuri, a big male from the West, who I haven't seen in some time. I'd love to see him. He's a formidable-looking cat. And, well, if he got hold of Hosanna, there would definitely be some trouble. But um, if Hosanna started calling, he would immediately attract the attention of any dominant leopard that is nearby. And that is an adver advertisement, basically like standing on top of the hill and shouting down any challenges come forward. Well, you better be sure when they come forward that you stand your ground, otherwise you will be chased. If you don't want to be seen, you just keep very quiet and skulk around within the territory and hopefully you don't get noticed. You hear the woodland kingfisher in the background, a very characteristic summertime call. Well, everybody, we've hopefully got some good news for you. Sydney has moved on from his hyenas. What has he got for you? I have just been to the Torchwood and I'm on my way out due to a very serious poor network access. And I was with the uh, Little Queen, I was with Talamba by the Torchwood Dam. Unfortunately, we could not manage to show you anything there due to the bad signals. But hopefully, Talamba will come out to our side. I am back again in Juma to see if I can find any other interesting animal for this afternoon.
So here I am now on Cheetah Cut Line, which is the border between us and uh, Torchwood. Here is where I normally read the information about animal trespassing from Juma to Torchwood and Torchwood back to Juma. I am trekking to see if uh, Tandy is not on our side yet. I didn't see any evidence showing the presence of Tandy in uh, Torchwood at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Giraffe Girl. You are words. They are so encouraging. I am now going to carry on and see if I can find you any of the other interesting animals. As I indicated, it's a general game viewing this afternoon. <laughs> uh, call six. Um, that is true. I am owing David his lilac breasted roller. But the search is still on. If I find one, I will show you. Maybe David is going to get married soon because lilac breasted roller has got a very interesting traditional belief whereby the groom and the bride use the feathers in order to build their love lasting relationship. So I have got. Uh, a very interesting animal here with me. This animal is not part of those animals we used to see traveling with. Today, the wildebeest decided to move around with the impalas. No zebras here. We know that uh, wildebeest, they do walk together with the zebras very often. But today, they are depending on the small animals. And this, I can assure you, has got something to do with the poor eyesight of the wildebeest and the better eyesight of the impalas. So small animals are benefiting the big animal. It's not always that the big animals benefit small animals. So uh, that is the blue wildebeest you can see that is looking very much healthy. Why I'm saying is the blue wildebeest? Because the tips of the horns are facing inwards. And if it's the black wildebeest, as we have got two wildebeest here in Southern Africa, the tips of the horns were going to face like this. Of the blue, of the black wildebeest, they face front, frontwards and upwards. Frontwards and upwards. For the blue wildebeest, it's just inwards. So that is how you can easily distinguish between these two species. But looking at the tail as well, this one has got a much darker tail. The black wildebeest has got a white tail. So you can easily see that from quite a long distance. So wildebeest, they do get preferred by the large predators such as the lions. I'm sure there in Masai Mara where David uh, is, he has been witnessing the lions going after the wildebeest. Because lions maybe can use uh, the advantage of their poor eyesight. <laughs> so you can see as well we have got the ox pecas on top. So they are also doing the same job they were doing uh, to the hippopotamus. So ox pecas, they are not discriminative. They just clean all these uh, herbivores. And when it comes to the lions, that oh look at that. Where the beast is just threatened by <laughs> the ox pecas. Uh, so now let's quickly go back to the entertaining cat of the afternoon in Juma, Steve with Hosanna. Well, if he wasn't breathing, I think he died because his tongue is lolling out the side of his face. <laughs> Everybody, we need to take screenshots of this, please, because, you know, an old man, we can show him what a silly, what a silly was when he was younger. <laughs> He's pulling his off his best Hukumuri impersonation, although Hukumuri's tongue normally hangs out the front of his mouth, Sana. Oh. Now he's found a very nice cool spot there. It's in the shade. Uh, no doubt the soil is a little bit cooler there than elsewhere. And I know I had questions the other day about why, where do leopards like to lie down. And while that is a very soft sort of erosion ditch that's coming down into the watering hole here. And that caused by water moving across an area that has been overgrazed. And while the soil in there has been shaded, there's probably a little bit of moisture still from the rain we had the other day. 
and a perfect little place to rest a tired and warm body. Okay, well, have you decided you're going to move, boy? Oh, I want to lie there, a little bit more open. There we go. Oh, isn't that the spot? Now that is the photograph that people are always looking for. The majestic cat. I had him the other day on the termite mound posing so beautifully for us. Oh, and the flies are starting to bother him. You can see that neck, can't you? The dewlap is starting to form. Uh, when you look at a female leopard, you'll notice that that sort of neck area is very sleek and very narrow and <laughs> chic. <laughs> you think Kazana's a hangover? Well, hungover from a steenbok, possibly. But, uh, I mean, this is. That most likely he was going to be sitting and doing pretty much nothing. Uh, but we were surprised when he popped out with us with the hyena and super the hyena and super blessed as well. Easy. But so we can get right in on that spot pattern there, Darby, on the top of the lip. You can see he's got three right at the top of the screen, just behind the nose. There's three spots there. And if he turns his head, and you'll see there's three on the other side. Sometimes we can identify them as well from the canines. For example, Tundi's right, right bottom canine is blunt. Um, that's obviously a sign of age. He looks like he got a bit of a, of a cut in his lip there. A little bit of loose skin. He's drooling. The panting. A little bit of air moving in to cool him down. Um, but one thing we've noticed is all the theories about leopards cooling down through panting and whatever has always been quite interesting but with the flare that Dave likes to put on you look at the bottom of leopards feet that is where they lose most of their heat well anyway a leopard is a little bit bigger than a lion cub and they probably lose heat a little bit slower but then they stay warm long into the night lion cubs need to cuddle with mum yes I'm not very sure leopards like the heat and more so Hostana that's why he could be a bit a little lazy here, but I got very playful cuts here. And the three cubs have woken up and I would say now they're shining, playing with their mothers as they are weaving through the grass in the Mara Triangle in the savannah. And I'm not sure exactly where they want to go, but we got two of the females that have moved quite far from these particular ones here, and they're about 100 meters away. And they're moving the intent, the two, but I'm sure this one is staying back behind to make sure these cubs are fine and safe. Now, we want to find out what strategy or what uh, plan or they're trying to lay. But I think the two have a plan and these are the two females are staying behind. For those of you who could be joining us now, this is the Sausage Tree Pride. And I got a feeling these lionesses are hungry. Their bellies don't look very full. There's one particular one that we call Kinktail because she got a little split on her tail. She looks big, her belly is so massive, but that there, there she is. But she, that doesn't mean she's full, I think, because she is pregnant and she'll be bringing her cubs anytime, maybe in a couple of uh, few days to come. And I'm looking at, at that more so during the new year. So we could be having new year with new cubs. Uh, time will tell. The other females missing here, I had very wrong predictions two weeks ago and I kept saying next week new cubs, next day new cubs, tomorrow new cubs, it never happened. I was with her last night and she was still very pregnant. Today she's missing. Jasmine, how are you today? And yes, I can tell you baby sausages have made my day and hopefully I'm going to continue with them until the end of the show and so Jasmine do not go anywhere because the mothers of these cubs just mean want to get these cubs some dinner at this age they have been able to eat meat they have been eating meat so it would be very exciting to see them eating meat if these females here will be successful initially they had seen a warthog and they were like they made the judgment and they found it's not worth it and they didn't go for it and they must be seeing something that i cannot see and I'm only guessing maybe this time it's not a warthog because in the kind of light we have, chances are it could be something bigger. And it could be maybe a toppy. Earlier I had also seen a toppy that disappeared somewhere. So I do not know what 
the ones in front are watching. These two are with the cubs and they're slowly following the other past two females. And that tree there, that's where the two have gone. They're not very far from that tree. Either they have crouched down in the grass or they're just somewhere where I can't see them. They would definitely blend in very well. They wouldn't want the prey to see them. Uh, my hope is they catch something for themselves because I can tell they are hungry and they definitely need some dinner tonight. Not knowing where the other female is and most likely they might drag something to her if maybe she has dropped her cubs because 100% she cannot leave them and if they are dropped it must be last night or this morning because I was with her last night until about 8.30 o'clock. It's barely 12 hours, I mean 24 hours ago and a lot would have happened between that time and now. So you look at the movement of the third Nile, lioness, that tells you lots of communication between her and the two that are ahead. And one of them might stay guarding the cubs. That's just my guess. But you never know, sometimes they have left the cubs, moved the four or the five of them all together, and left instructions to the cubs, stay put, don't move, we'll call you if we need you. She's crouching, and that is a stalking mode to me, and she just lay down though. Yes, and it couldn't be better. This is just so cool, and this is what Safari Life is all about, and our joy is always to bring you such sightings, which also gives us a lot of joy. To be able to see this every day gives us lots of happiness. Now, what do you want to do? The cubs are not as playful as before. Either they've been too, too slow, maybe not to spoil the hunt. Now, this one is taking a different direction. This one's kinky. If you look at her tail, you can see she got a split on the tail. And see how she stopped. She looked. And of the five females in this pride, she is the oldest. Look at her belly and see how big it is. Definitely, that is not meat in it. Of course, I got feeling there's some cubs in there. I do not know how many cubs she got in there. Lioness says she'll get anything, one to four cubs. The maximum I have always known are four cubs, but it's always an average of one to two, occasionally three. Four is always a very big number. Now, being the eldest, she's very experienced, and you do not know what she is telling the others. They use lots of body language. And what we want to do now is to move a little bit forward and try to see what we can get a different angle. We do not want to get very close. We do not want to interfere with the hunting, but also we don't want to miss any special moment because the two that I can see, I do not know what they're doing and I don't know where they are. But I think something could be happening here. As we do that, let's take you back to Steve with Hosanna. Mm. Thanks, David. I hope the Sausage Tree Pride gets up to some action this afternoon. They were very flat last night. And, well, hopefully they managed to catch something just before the end of the show. We do know they are very efficient hunters. And I do know that that area is starting to dry up with game. Still buffalo around and probably some topi. Um, but most of the wildebeest have moved off again. And Hassan is not too bothered about any of that right now. He is what we call a flat cat. He's got a little bit of a belly on him there. His, his right front, left front foot is twitching a little bit. As he's probably replaying his Steenbock hunt. <laughs> what a beautiful cat. He's dreaming. He likes dreaming. He takes after his dad. His dad is a serious napper. Oh, there we go. Trying to get comfortable. You know that feeling, folks, when you're just so extremely hot, you just can't quite find the right position to move into. There's a bit of respite, though. The sun has gone behind us. Some clouds. Hello, Keith. No, when a leopard is panting heavily like that, it's basically to do with the fact that he's warm and also to do with the fact that he's digesting a lot of protein inside his belly 
and when his belly is full, leopards and lions have the ability to gorge themselves and when the belly gets full, what it does is it pushes the diaphragm up and the diaphragm then limits the amount of space that the lungs have to work. So he can't really take deep breaths, it's all shallow breaths because of the limited movement inside. So this is characteristic of a leopard or a cat that has eaten and also on a warm day like this. This is very, very normal. Um, a leopard that's stressed will be showing signs of stress in the fact that their body language will generally be one of quite flat to the ground, eye contact, be looking at whatever it is that's a threat and looking a little bit jumpy. Um, male leopards that interact with each other drool a lot, sort of the, the saliva, they salivate. I had Hukumuri last night drooling incessantly and uh, he sign of, of stress and also testosterone build up within the cat due to possibly some conflict. Um, what exactly the purpose of the saliva over indulgence is really I, I'm unsure of. Maybe someone out there can inform me if they know why do male leopards when they encounter each other drool so much. Um, I really don't know. It's kind of like an um, anticipation of something. Maybe it's got to do with anticipation of a fight anticipation of maybe needing more moisture in the mouth because um, becoming aggressive with another male might require a little bit more moisture and more swallowing power maybe the saliva helps them to growl uh, to sort of lubricate the mouth and to allow the, the internal bits of the mouth to, to vibrate a little bit more uh, for example you get a little bit of a parched mouth if you want to sing nicely you need to drink some water so as to lubricate I'm just kind of assuming things here. Maybe there is a more plausible response or answer. There you can see his left hand side of the face now. You see the three spots there as well. Sorry, Emma. Raina wants to know about something about leopard habitat. I didn't get the first part there. Oh, droughts. So, Raina, you want to know about droughts. If anything, droughts improve leopard hunting due to the fact that the leopards feed on meat. Uh, drought affects the vegetation, it affects the foliage, the grass layer, and what that does is it leads to animals losing condition. And an animal that's lost condition is generally a little bit easier to catch than an animal that is in full, full strength. So what we saw, I didn't see it, but earlier this year, no, it was last year. Last year there was a serious drought and the buffalo, some of the bulls that I found around, the carcasses on the property, enormous horns. Those animals were so emaciated that it made it very easy work for the lions to catch. So the drought actually improves predators and the predators pick off the weak and the, the, the not so fit. And that is part and parcel of sort of survival of the fittest. The ones that survive the drought uh, then go on to breed the next year. But if anything, droughts and times of dryness and times of scarcity for prey, food is definitely a time that predators such as lion, hyena and uh, leopard capitalize. Most certainly. Well, as we sit here, the sun slowly hiding behind some clouds, a little bit of cool respite for us. David in the Mara, who's an hour ahead, has already put on his second layer of shuka. Well, yes, Steve, you're right. It's much colder here than it is in, uh, uh, in Juma, because when we started, it was about 27 and maybe 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but I'm sure now, we could be doing maybe low 20s because they're really cool off. Now our cubs are still being very playful here and they're somewhere on the right there and we cannot see the parents because the parents have gone further away so what we want to do is to stay with the cubs for a couple of minutes and not to follow the adults or the mothers very closely not to interfere with whatever they could be doing but you can see in these cubs here which we all know now they are boys and you can tell when you look below the tail of that one particular and they're all three boys so the two that are older are about four months and the young one is about three months Andre you would like to know where lions hunt I mean hide their cubs they could hide their cubs anywhere it could be in a burrow it could be next to a tamid mound 
or it could be in a hollow or an, you know a hollow tree or sometimes in between rocks or grasses like this if these cubs go flat here i can tell you you will not see them and of course they got their kind of communication and the parents or the mothers can easily tell them stay here and do not move so they usually have so many choices or so many places where they can hide their cubs so those are the address there and I think they have made now two attempts to hunt the first one was a warthog and this particular one was also two warthogs and either the wind was going or the wind was in the favor of the warthogs I don't think the warthogs saw these lionesses but they just smelled them and they just took off so they have to try one more time so they're gonna sit together and make a new plan now when we have the migration I'm talking about when you have the wildebeest and the zebras around here it's always a piece of cake for these lionesses to hunt but once they're gone it becomes a bit tricky and tight for them to be able to look for prey and they have to look for small little prey like you know wild hogs small little antelopes like hartbeest or toppies and occasionally they look for the big and dangerous prey I'm talking of buffaloes Albert you say this is beautiful and it is stunning and Albert just to see a lioness there with the green plus plus the the sky there it makes it it's so so colorful and I'm happy Albert that's a great comment and just see that lioness there let's find out where the other ones are and especially the cubs but something tells me if not tonight Albert look at that if not tonight then tomorrow morning they must get something there. look at that sky there Albert and I'm sure you Albert and all the other wonderful viewers are taking some wonderful screenshots this is the beauty of the Marva Triangle and the trees you see there we call them the torchwood trees very iconic trees of the Mara so one line is coming back after the failed attempt second failed attempt to hunt a warthog so they're going to be sitting together but I'm sure before long they might surprise us with another move now Sydney tell us what you are up to so what would happen another plan they would make whoops what's running there well I thought something was running but it was just my own imagination I thought oh are they catching something now in the background there you can see the thick clouds that are building and we have been having some short rains in Kenya but they have been hammering us every other day but I would say this is the sixth day straight without a single drop of rain which is just wonderful well rain is good when it comes it makes the whole area here green which is good for all the herbivores which translates to wonderful uh, time for the cats look at all the tortured trees in the Mara and how beautiful is that you imagine I see this every other day this is very exciting I will keep staying with my sausages here or with my lionesses and their cubs to see what other move they might be doing and do not go away but in the meantime we'll take you back to Steve with Hosanna thanks David well we are still in the same place and I must apologize Dave has just reminded me that I said a word quite incorrectly moments ago I meant to say emaciated not emaciated to apologize some really big words coming out of my mouth today I think I'm also a little bit hot like Hosanna a little bit um well we're not hung over but that feeling you get when the, the the Sun cooks your brain I do apologize nothing has changed since you were last here Except apart from it getting slightly cooler very gentle breeze starting to pick up 
Hello, child of the universe. Hosada has got a preference. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't narrow it down to one species specifically. Um, we've seen him with many Deka. We've seen him with a number of Nyala and Impala. Um, young Nyala, though. I haven't yet seen him with a big Nyala. I think while I was in the Mara, he managed to get hold of whether he caught them or not, or if they were just pregnant females that didn't do very well with the drought. Um, he had them anyway. Um, but I haven't seen him yet with a warthog. No one that I, none of the viewers, I believe, have seen him yet with a warthog. That's the, the experienced level. You move up to a warthog, just like a male leopard or a young female leopard becomes an adult, truly an adult, when they're able to take a fully grown male impala. Because, well, they are much bigger and stronger than the females. A little bit... Um, more difficult to catch. There, Darby's just catching some comb ducks as they flew off. Off they go. The male, also known as the knobbed billed duck, with their really big sort of knob on the end of the nose, which is still very strange to me why they have such an interesting appendage. <laughs> Linda from California. He is always dreaming. I'd love to know what's going on in his head. And we all come up with all sorts of theories and ideas. But um, <laughs> if only we knew. He's probably thinking about all of the different impalas and nyalas. And oh, he's had a few steenbok as well. I haven't seen him with many. We found him with a, a steenbok this morning. I think that for me is the first steenbok I've seen him with. But then also, how many scrub hairs has he caught? We have no idea. And uh, last year, before I got here, I mean, he was, maybe it was the year before, he was quite young and he managed to catch himself a monitor lizard. That he thoroughly enjoyed. I think there was a period as well when he went through a stage of enjoying terrapins. Uh, maybe he just thought that they were quite nice in the beginning and slow moving. I saw him with a terrapin at Voyatella Pan earlier this year that he basically just played with for a while and then let go. I obviously realized, well, oh, a little bit of a twitch in there. He's definitely having some form of dream. As Emma says, he's probably counting impalas. Impala lambs. Fast asleep. But that's the thing, folks, is that he might seem fast asleep, but like any cat, he is still very alert. The ears are twitching. The, the nose is always, well, that was very well timed. The nose is able to smell, and he's very alert to whatever might be approaching. But anyway, Sydney, I think, is back down at Chitwet Watering Hole. Let's go and see what exactly he's found. You can see that I have got a roller now for David Gatamba Gitu from Kenya. I have executed the instruction. The beautiful roller is right there. Look at that. This is quite a lovely bird. And this bird, as I indicated, is associated with uh, the marriages. Traditionally, this is a bird which can be able to solidify a couple. So during the wedding, you just have to hold each other's hand with the feather of this bird in the middle. That is a symbol of an ever-love-lasting relationship. Some of the tribes, they're even making some of the rings from these birds. They've got a very interesting acrobatic flight when they are charming each other for breeding purposes. And another interesting part is they are monogamous. They are partners for life. Maybe that is why uh, they are used in order to solidify couples. <laughs> so we are very lucky to find this bird very much stationary. A sinek, it is not uh, uncommon. That is very much usual. I have seen a leopard catching a dove before. Leopards, they are so opportunistic hunters and they can just go for anything which presents itself. Whether bird, insects, they also catch. The, we have got a competition with them when it comes to the swamps, the alets, the reproductive of the termites. When they see them, they also catch them. So they don't only concentrate on the big animals. They also catch mongoose. <laughs> I think Osana has been seen as well chasing mongoose before. So it's normal. Leopard is like that. Don't only go for a big animal. If it's tough, they can go for something small. So I'm just going to carry on now. I am still around the Chitwa Chitwa. 
I'm just driving around here to see if we cannot be lucky with any of the predators coming to drink uh, at the waterhole. But I am not winning. I'm going to have to head back to the waterhole and see from there if we can find something. <laughs> Chasing the small prey is interesting. Not only the mongoose sea neck, including the scrub hairs. If you see the leopard chasing the scrub hair, it's so interesting. <laughs> Those small animals trying to use all the different anti predator strategies to confuse the big predators. So amazing. So I must have to try by all means and find something here in pre preparation of the SABC show later on. <laughs> I am going to try. Thank you very much for all the uh, comments. I feel very much inspired. So I'm, I will try here. Maybe I will be lucky. But it's good that my friend uh, Steve has got something and also David I'm sure he might be having some lions for later on Oh here we've got another animal. This is so cute. He's got very beautiful and lovely horns Look at that. Can you see him there? This is a beautiful water bug. Look at that. Look at those horns and so far I'm only just seeing him there. I'm not seeing the other group members. Look at that. Look at those horns. How big are they? And when he's looking forward. You can see the water bug is just now having some of the fresh grasses. These animals, they don't mark territories same like other animals. They don't use urine and droppings. They rely on their own body odor in order to communicate for territorial purposes. They have got what is called subcutaneous gland. This gland, they use it for waterproof and also to warn the intruders about their level of dominance in the area. You can see there by the neck, it's got a white beep. The beep and the hairs on the necks, they use this kind of animal to scare the others. Child of the universe, you can see this universe is having those beautiful animals. So look at that. So you can see as well the white line at the back. <laughs> yeah, it's very rare to come across a water bug coming much closer like now. Only now that is trying to be inquisitive. Uh, but I can promise you he's going to come past here. He's trying to listen. Maybe he's not concentrating on me. So while I am um, heading back to uh, the waterhole, let's quickly go back to Steve with Hosanna. Thanks. It is good luck in your search that side. Sana is a flat cat. Well, it has been marvelous spending time with him this afternoon. He has graced us with his presence. He did what he's done so many times in the past. He saw, he, he, he looked, he sucked, he, he seeked. I kind of know what I'm saying. He looked for us. He came to find us because, well, he's quite a lonely fellow. We do know he likes to spend time with his dad. He likes to hang around hyenas. He even tries to follow Tundi around and well, Darby was on the vehicle once with Brent and Brent was off the vehicle looking for Hosanna and um, Darby had the camera framed like this and Hosanna just walks into frame going, I'm here, everybody, <laughs> I'm here, say hello. And that's practically what he did with us now. So it is always important to follow predators. In the Mara, David does that as well. You find the hyenas, you follow them, you might find some lions. You might find lions and then you find the hyenas afterwards. Here is a very similar story. If you find a hyena, you might find a leopard. And if you spend time long enough with a leopard, there's a very good chance hyenas will materialize in the area because they love to smell them out. And there is huge competition between them for food resource. And regardless of how efficient he is at hunting and catching his prey, Hosanna still has to have the necessary skills 
to tree the kill, which Tandi wasn't able to do the other day and then lost that Impala on the Torchwood Cheetah Cut Line boundary. So very, very important for them to be able to cache their food. It is the strategy that sees leopards dominate in areas like this. When they can get their food up the tree, they really are very, very successful. Well, everybody, thank you for joining this afternoon on Safari Live. We have thoroughly enjoyed your questions and comments. To FC and all those in the Mara, thank you for assisting as well. We'll see you tomorrow morning bright and early for another Safari. Have a beautiful evening and good night.